the halls of Texas Stadium long have been corridors of power in the National Football League. But this season, the Dallas Cowboys' usual stroll to the playoffs became a maze out of which they could not find their way. In one glorious moment, the Cowboys fielded their finest squad ever. Unfortunately, this club could not help Tom Landry, for it was comprised of players elected to the silver anniversary team. Absent this season were nine key veterans. Instead of household names like Pearson, Martin, Donovan, and Dupree, the roster of America's team was somewhat anonymous. This silver season had a different look, one where the Cowboys fell back to spring ahead, a year that offered glimpses of brighter horizons. Opening night saw the team touch down in Los Angeles, where quarterback Gary Hogaboom sent the Cowboys airborne with 350 yards passing. The defense intercepted five passes to seal a 20 to 13 victory. The Cowboys went on to win four of their first five games with a cavalcade of game-breaking plays. First down, we got a little uh, quick screen to Renfro, who's throwing deep to Donnelly, and it is caught! Boy, they're coming. They're coming like gangbusters. If you get off the screen, door set at the 30, 35, 40, 45, midfield. One man to beat. He's to the gone. 30-yard line. He's, he's gone. gone. He's gone. Hey. That's a 70-yard touchdown for Tony Dorsett. After five weeks, it seemed like business as usual in Dallas. And the playoffs looked like money in the bank. <laughs> On the surface, the Cowboys appeared to be quite dazzling. But their early successes proved merely cosmetic. For without makeup, they did not stand up to close inspection. The offense was never synchronized in 1984, scoring 171 fewer points than the previous year. They allowed 48 sacks and often broke down in critical situations. What began as an orderly march to the NFC Eastern title took an about face, and the Cowboys were forced to retreat. The St. Louis Cardinals rolled to a 31 to 20 victory. Then the Washington Redskins pranced to an easy 34 to 14 win. Two shocking losses to division rivals were followed by a grim contest with the New Orleans Saints. Trailing 27 to six in the third quarter, the Cowboys launched the biggest comeback in their 25 year history. The rally was spurred by a defense that choked off the Saints passing attack and finally caught them in a stranglehold in the fourth quarter. Big play, three minutes left. Saints up by seven, Stabler to throw. Here comes the pressure. Sack! And the ball! Oh, oh, the ball! Oh, oh, oh. It is a touchdown! Ah! <laughs> Randy White falls, Stabler, and the ball came loose. And Jeffco recovered. You gotta believe, Brad! Jim Jeffcoat's touchdown sent the game into overtime and onto the toe of Raphael Septien. The crowd will tell you if the Cowboys win on the kick. Good snap, good hold, kick up. Cowboys win! The overtime win was a watershed victory for the Cowboys and focused attention on the special teams, a unit that went all out, all season. Here, rookies and young Cowboys began to build confidence and reputations. Youngsters like Billy Cannon, Carl Howard, Victor Scott, Vince Albritton, Steve DiAssi, and Jeff Rohrer learned that solid hits were stepping stones to a starting job. Such a player is special teams captain Bill Bates, the Tennessee tough guy whose winning attitude, competitive spirit, 
and all-out play on coverage teams impressed many, including his coach. I think Bill Bates had a lot to do with bringing the specialty player back again in the NFL. Just the fact that at the end of the year, the NFL alumni honored him as a special player, that's a tremendous boost for all those guys that play on those specialty teams. And it's contagious, really. When you see a Bill Bates come in and play and hit and attack the way he does, boy, it has a real good effect upon your team. I was ingrained in playing hard nose football ever since I was eight years old, playing for a team called the Headhunters. And, uh, I've always enjoyed football. I've enjoyed the hitting part of it. You know, ever since I've been growing up, I've been uh, talented as made, maybe being like a Charlie Waters or a Cliff Harris type player. Number 40 is like a human cannonball. And when his fuse is lit, Bates can be very explosive indeed. They like free agents to come in to make their team, and it just kind of made them more of America's team, giving the guy that walking down the street the chance to play football. And, and I just want everybody to know that no matter who they are, you know, if you are playing football and you think you've got the desire and ability to, to play, then you've got the chance. you just got to do it. Bates maintained the cowboy tradition of turning unknown players into Pro Bowl performers. But what worried Tom Landry was supply and demand. The Cowboys desperately needed depth from the draft. Eugene Lockhart, the number six pick studied under retiring star Bob Brunig, stepped into the middle linebacker slot and became known as Mean Gene, the hitting machine. Playing alongside All-Pro Randy White for a full season, transformed second-year defensive end Jim Jeffco from a player with potential into a potential star. Once Jeffco got the hang of the flex, he had quarterbacks on the end of a rope and collected 11 and a half sacks. These young players were needed down the stretch. The Cowboys stood at six and four when they faced the Cardinals in St. Louis. Since all four losses were within the division, another defeat would cripple their playoff hopes. Slipping their backs into the secondary, the Cowboys used touchdowns by James Jones and Ron Springs to upset the Cardinals 24 to 17. But the topsy-turvy nature of their season was reflected by a harsh 14 to three loss the following week in Buffalo. The failure to score a touchdown marked an offensive deficiency that plagued both Danny White and Gary Hogaboom for most of 1984. The quarterbacks, hamstrung by a severely depleted and crippled offensive line, never knew from week to week who was healthy enough to block for them. Lacking a solid pocket meant life on the run for both quarterbacks and makeshift line combinations and injured receivers were largely responsible for the radical drop-off in point production. One player who did score points was number 30, Timmy Newsom, a battering ram near the end zone. Springs number 20 could turn ordinary plays White into extraordinary to touchdowns. Over the middle. Springs, nice catch, gets away. 40-yard line, 30-yard line, 20, a foot race, 10, 5, touchdown, Cowboys! A welcome addition to the receiving core was Mike Renfro. Renfro, acquired as a situation specialist, became a starter and produced the highest average per catch of any receiver.
he recovered from a shoulder separation, Tony Hill remained the premier deep threat. In an off year, number 80 still gained the most yards and scored more touchdowns than any Cowboy pass catcher. Tight end Doug Cosby was the most consistent and durable receiver. Number 84 is blessed with intense concentration and the willingness to take the toughest punishment an opponent can dish out. Cosby's reception total paced the Cowboys and his 60 catches ranked second among tight ends in the National Football Conference. While their offensive woes were uncharacteristic, they were still in the casting call for the playoffs, a role which has always been tailor-made for them. The Cowboys needed 10 gallons of tenacity to reach the playoffs for the 18th time in 19 years. And the gallop down the stretch was mounted on defense. A 13th week victory over the Patriots was keyed by all pro Michael Downs, number 26. Good things came in bunches. The following week, Dennis Thurman touched off a win over the Eagles with a similar play. Thurman's touchdown and seven quarterback sacks ensured a 26 to 10 victory. And Pisarchi with a play fake and a throw. Here comes Dutton. Got him for a safety in the end zone. The Cowboys record read nine and five. And they were tied atop the NFC East with the Redskins and Giants. Atop the division had a nice familiar ring to it. And so did the frightening sounds coming from another familiar voice. The doomsday defense. the defense did best was sack the quarterback. The Cowboys blitzed and then blitzed some more. Safeties like Dexter Klinkscale and Michael Downs and linebackers like Anthony Dickerson and Mike Hegman swarmed the field. Up front came White, Jeff Coe, John Dutton, Don Smerrick, and Ed Tutal Jones. They came anytime, anywhere, and from every direction. Fifty-seven quarterback traps made life easier for cornerbacks Ron Fellows and Everson Walls, number 24. Number 26, Michael Downs, was everywhere. He led the team in tackles. He roamed the secondary, producing seven interceptions, a club high. A quick blitz up the gut led to Downstown a place where no quarterback wanted to be left alone. Downs played like an all-pro all season, a season that had wound down to the final two weeks. Victory over the arch-rival Redskins would guarantee the Cowboys a playoff berth. The offensive line of Peterson, Scott, Baldinger, Titanser, Rafferty, and Paz Derrick, so often injured, so often criticized, were the building blocks around which a seemingly insurmountable lead was built. A skillfully designed offense baffled the Redskins beating them short and deep. Right back to throw deep. Renfro, right sideline, caught at the 25-20. 15 makes a move to the 10. Renfro, touchdown, Cowboys! After teetering on a tightrope for most of this silver season, the Cowboys' path became a straight and narrow shaft of sunlight. The Cowboys sprinted to a 21-6 halftime lead. 
But when the race became a marathon of cowboy mistakes, the Redskins passed them in the third quarter. White back to throw, Springs gets him a block, throwing deep for Tony Hill. Hill makes the catch at the five, goes in for the easy touchdown. The Cowboys clawed back into the lead, 28 to 23. But the victory hinged on a controversial play at the goal line. On the one, split backs this time. And off Riggins up the middle. No, Jeff Rohr, Steve Diasi, Gene Lockhart, they call it a touchdown. Oh, I thought they had him pushed back. While one door to the playoff slammed shut, another one opened in Miami. Two identical plays captured the joy and the frustration of the 1984 season. In the first quarter, Ron Fellows stole the ball from number 83, Mark Clayton. fourth quarter with the score tied at 14. A cowboy blitz left Fellows vulnerable, and only a split second separated his second interception from Clayton's touchdown. The Dolphins led 21 to 14 with exactly two minutes remaining in the 1984 season. Cowboys from the shotgun in the two-minute period. White back to throw. Left side. It goes. Oh, no, it's tipped and caught. Oh, my goodness. This is going to be a touchdown. This is going to be a deflected touchdown to Tony Hill. This is the most unbelievable thing I've ever seen. The Cowboys have just scored. Oh, me. Tony Hill's miraculous play Boy, tied crazy. the game at 21. But this was not to be a silver season of miracles for the Dallas Cowboys. At the 45, 40, good night. Clayton for the touchdown. Defensive back fell down. For the second straight week, victory was snatched from the Cowboys' grasp in the final minute. And for the first time in 10 years, they would not be going to the playoffs. The Dallas Cowboys extended an NFL record with their 19th straight winning season and will greet next year with far greater spirit and unity than they began 1984. Two major reasons are their team captains, Randy White on defense and Tony Dorsett on offense. Dorsett enjoyed his greatest season even though he found more dead ends than open spaces. What he did find was more ways to beat an opponent. Number 33 polished skills he already possessed and displayed others that few had ever witnessed. Tony exhibited a toughness, both mental and physical, that pushed him over a thousand yards rushing. And once in sight of a touchdown, his natural instincts led him to six points. Set was a man on the move. Randy White was the immovable man. Despite being hacked at, cut, clipped, double and triple teamed, number 54 recorded 12 and a half sacks, the most by a defensive tackle in the NFL. 
once you hit the field, you don't worry about getting double teamed or, or triple teamed or, or anything else. Your, your main objective is to do the job that you're supposed to do. If it's get the quarterback, you get the quarterback. And uh, anything standing in your path, you try and get him out of your way and get your job done. To get recognition, you have to have a lot of quarterback tracks. So it's a gratifying thing to get back there and get the quarterback. But I get as much satisfaction out of making a good play on a running play as I do trapping the quarterback sometimes. He's a fighter. He's a winner. The only way he's going to ever get him to quit is to shoot him. Uh, he's going to keep coming at you every down, every play, until the whistle blows, until the clock runs out. But those are the kind of guy that you don't look forward to playing in front of. He has a great desire not to be embarrassed. He doesn't want anyone being able to beat him. Randy White and Tony Dorsett personify a team with a tradition of excellence. 1985 will be a season of high expectations, for this is a team tied to its past and bound to the future. At their silver anniversary celebration, the Dallas Cowboys remembered old heroes, last second victories, and world championships. But their vision is pointed toward tomorrow, and tomorrow began the morning after the night fell on the 1984 season. Thank you.